Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today I'm going to be introducing you to market failures. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review Booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics and macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. Now, so far in this class, we've been learning about how amazing free markets are. They are very efficient at allocating our scarce resources when there are no externalities and those markets are competitive. But today we're going to talk about market failures and market failures occur when a free market fails to achieve an allocatively or socially optimal outcome. Now we have a few different sources of market failures. One of those is monopoly power. As you already know, monopolies underproduce and overcharge and they are not allocatively efficient. But we also have externalities. Externalities occur when there are costs or benefits that fall on people who don't produce or purchase a product. And we'll learn about the impact of externalities more in our next video. If there are negative externalities that have costs on people who don't purchase or produce the product, like pollution, we are going to overproduce the product in the free market. And if there are positive externalities where benefits fall on people who don't buy or produce the product, we are going to underproduce that good or service. Positive externalities come from things like security cameras in your neighborhood. Now, the reason why we are concerned with market failures is because they don't create social efficiency. You've already learned a little bit about social efficiency when you learned the term allocative efficiency in previous units. In this unit, when we refer to allocative efficiency, we often call it socially optimal. But they're the same thing. It means that we're producing where the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. In unit three and four, we said that the price equals the marginal cost when we were talking about firms. Because when firms produce where the price equals the marginal cost, they are allocatively efficient or socially optimal. But in previous units, we were looking at the costs and benefits for the people buying or selling the product. Here, we're not looking at just the individuals within the transaction, but we're looking for the cost for society and the benefits for society as a whole. So we're going to be looking at the marginal social benefit and the marginal social cost. And so the socially optimal, allocatively efficient or socially efficient outcome is where marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. It means the quantity that we're getting for society is where all marginal benefits equal all marginal costs. So if we graph it out, we have the marginal social cost curve sloping upward, the marginal social benefit curve sloping downward. If we produce below the intersection between those two curves, the marginal social benefit is going to be greater than the marginal social cost. And we are underproducing within this market. At this quantity, our marginal social cost is right there. The marginal social benefit is there and the marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit point is right there. Those three points give us a triangle of dead weight loss. But if we produce more than that intersection there, we are going to have the marginal social cost being greater than the marginal social benefit. There is the marginal social cost of that quantity. There's the marginal social benefit of that quantity. There's our marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost point. And those three points give us a dead weight loss triangle for overproducing this product. It is at the intersection of those two curves where we see the marginal social benefit equaling the marginal social cost. And that's where we see the socially optimal outcome. So just like we've learned with individuals, society should act as long as the marginal benefit or the marginal social benefit in this case is greater than or equal to the marginal cost or marginal social cost in this case. Now the best place to be is where the marginal social cost equals the marginal social benefit. But sometimes you won't have numbers that bring you to that point. But you keep on acting as long as that marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal social cost. But society should never act when the marginal social benefit is less than the marginal social cost because that makes us less efficient. This is just another variation of the marginal analysis stuff that you've already learned before in previous units. Here we're just looking at all costs and all benefits for society as a whole. So here are some examples. If we're trying to decide whether or not we should build another park, if the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal social cost, yes, build that park. If we're trying to decide how many trees we should cut down to build houses, the answer is we should cut trees until the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost and then stop. If we're trying to decide how much pollution we should clean up, well, the answer is we should clean up until the marginal social benefit of cleaning equals the marginal social cost of cleaning and then stop. Of course, in reality, it's going to be difficult to figure out the marginal social costs and the marginal social benefits of these things, but if we can figure them out, that would be the socially optimal outcome. Now, when it comes to competitive markets with no externalities, they are socially optimal. 
And that's because the marginal social cost curve is the supply curve when there are no externalities. And that demand curve is the marginal social benefit curve when there are no externalities. And if we underproduce, we're going to have deadweight loss. We will also have deadweight loss if we overproduce. But when we have a free market with no government intervention, we will reach equilibrium. And that's where we are, allocatively efficient or socially optimal. Because at the equilibrium quantity, the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. And there is no market failure when we reach equilibrium. Next, we're going to take a look at efficiency for individual firms. First, let's look at perfectly competitive firms. If this firm produces less than the profit maximizing quantity where MR equals MC, we will have that red triangle of deadweight loss. If they produce more than the profit maximizing quantity, we will have that triangle of deadweight loss. But when this firm profit maximizes, they produce where MC, which is the marginal social cost when there's no externalities, equals the demand curve, which is the marginal social benefit as well. We usually say price equals marginal cost when a perfectly competitive firm is allocatively efficient or socially optimal. And so there is no market failure for a perfectly competitive firm that is profit maximizing. But when it comes to imperfectly competitive firms, there will be some deadweight loss at the profit maximizing quantity. And that's because the price is greater than the marginal cost at that profit maximizing quantity. The socially optimal quantity will be where the marginal cost equals that demand curve, QS, right there. And that's because imperfectly competitive firms underproduce and overcharge at the profit maximizing quantity. And they are not socially efficient as a result. When it comes to labor markets, a monopsony is also not allocatively efficient. And they have that triangle of deadweight loss. If a monopsony was socially optimal, it would hire QS for the workers and pay WS for the wage. But they aren't socially optimal because they underhire and underpay compared to a competitive market. And there you have it. That is your introduction to market failures. In the next video, we're going to talk about positive and negative externalities. That is one type of market failure. And in the next video, we're going to talk about government regulation of firms, which can produce more efficient outcomes if they're properly crafted. If you still need some more help, head over to reviewecon.com and pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see you all next time.